Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm Rocco, and uh, thanks again for joining me for another episode of my Genesis review series. And today we're going to be tackling Genesis's seventh album, or yes, their seventh album, because we're not counting from Genesis to Revelation. The magnificent 1976 release, Wind and Wuthering. And uh, before I start the review, guys, I just want to give you guys a little disclaimer that I'm back to school now. I'm, as you can see, I'm a fucking mess. I haven't shaved in five days. I've been, like, locked up in this dungeon doing all these readings on, like, depression, anxiety, all these drug-related things. Because I'm in pharmacy school. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. But the point is, I've been busting my ass. And uh, if this week's been any indication... The, these videos are going to have to start slowing down. I'm probably going to have to start releasing them like every three weeks or every two, every two weeks, I'm hoping. But realistically, every three weeks. And uh, that's just the way it is. That's just the life circumstance right now. But I, I still love making these reviews. And I'm definitely going to finish the whole Genesis discography. You mark my fucking words. It's going to happen. Because I got to get this... I gotta get this shit released because my passion for Genesis is just bursting at the seams right now. Like, I'm listening to them, like, all the freaking time. And yeah, so today we're gonna be tackling Wind and Wuthering, uh, the second Genesis album from 1976. Uh, this, I think, I believe 1976 was the only year where Genesis had two releases, uh, which was kind of, which was kind of unique at the time because, you know, bands would, um, a lot of bands at the time would release two albums a year, I would say. Or, you know, they could release two albums a year. Nowadays, it's it's virtually unheard of. I mean, you have bands like Tool releasing albums every, like, 13 years. Or Metallica every eight years. And, um, you know, these days we consider, like, a two, three-year time gap to be, like, the norm with album releases. But back then, two in a year was was considered, you know, the usual. And whether that be a testament to, like, the creativity of the bands or more like a more likely explanation, just how the music industry was back then, uh, just remains to be seen. But, but yeah, it was they released two albums in 1976. And uh, this album's a very nostalgic one for me. Ah, I remember it like it was yesterday, the first time I heard Wind and Wuthering. I was actually, I was at, just like Trespass, I was actually sick that day. And I stayed home from school. I believe it was, I was in grade 10 or grade 11. So about, mm, yeah, I guess about seven years ago now. And um, I stayed home and I decided to just put on this album. It was on YouTube. And I listened to it and it was like a cold autumn day. And I just stared outside the window from my bedroom with this album perfectly like accompanying in the background and it was just the perfect atmosphere for that day you know I was all congested and it was just a shitty day and just the album artwork itself I mean you look at the album cover it's this like tree in this misty meadow and you could tell it's autumn and all the tree all the leaves are about to fall down and uh, there's just like this dark like this dark sinister vibe about it and then you listen to the music and it's just the perfect representation of that vibe on the album cover Definitely one of the best Genesis album covers. And, uh, you know, a lot of fans seem to really, really love this album and really regard it very highly. In fact, I've heard many people uh, consider this to be a better album than Wind and Wood. So just to start off the review, I will say that I... I sorry, I meant uh, Trick of the Tail, not Wind and Wuthering, Trick of the Tail. Um, I will start this review by saying that I do prefer Trick of the Tail to this album. But there's a few caveats to that because... I feel like this album could have been better than Trick of the Tail if the band made the right choices. And we'll get into that later in the review, but just suffice it to say, this could have been better than Trick of the Tail, or at least equal to it. But as it stands, I do prefer Trick of the Tail to this album. And uh, yeah, this album here is just a very, very different Genesis album. I mean, l l let's just talk about the history, I guess, first. So uh, where were Genesis in 1976? Well, we already talked about Trick of the Tail, where uh, they overcame the hurdle of losing Peter Gabriel, their you know lead singer, one of the founding members, one of the most unique components of Genesis. And uh, suffice it to say, they, they rose above the adversity, released Trick of the Tail, had a fantastic tour, actually expanded their audience in America. I believe Trick of the Tail went up to number three on the British album charts, and everything was looking great. So at this point, Genesis were super optimistic for the future. You know, they must have had a strong, 
belief in their fan base that they embraced them even after Peter Gabriel left. And, uh, you know, I, as an aside, that's really rare for a fan base to just, you know, just embrace a band after like the lead singer left in the years to come. A lot of people would like jump off the bandwagon, but at that point they supported Genesis a hundred percent because the music was just that strong. I mean, when you have stuff like dance on a volcano, fucking ripples, squonk, things like that, like you can't deny the quality of that music, no matter who's singing it. And, uh, yeah, so Genesis were really confident at this point. And, uh, Another significant thing was that Steve Hackett had released his solo album, uh, The Voyage of the Acolyte, which came out, I believe, after The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And uh, as I mentioned in the previous video, he was kind of devoid of ideas on Trick of the Tail, so he was happy to just be like kind of like the background guitar player. But not on this album. On this album, all the ideas came rushing back in, and he had worked, he had built up like a vast library of songs that he was willing to uh, to pitch to Genesis. And coming into this album, I hate to say it, but a lot of the other members of Genesis weren't really big fans of what Steve Hackett was bringing in. And, you know, he does have a strong influence on this album. Let's just say that right off the bat. But they did reject, like, a lot of his standalone compositions, except for one song, Blood on the Rooftops, which is, we'll talk about a lot later, but it's one of the best Genesis songs. And, uh... Yeah, basically that created a lot of tensions in the band with Steve Hackett having like so many ideas, kind of like analogous to George Harrison of the Beatles, where he had so many ideas left over from the Beatles that he released a triple album, All Things Must Pass, another classic masterpiece. But anyway, I'm going on a tangent. So uh, with Steve Hackett kind of just, you know, his a lot of his material being rejected, Tony Banks really like took the reins of this album. And if he wasn't the leader of the band on Trick of the Tail, which he was, he it, there's no question, he was definitely the leader of the band on Wind and Wuthering. I mean, his songwriting credits are just scattered throughout this entire album. And he really took hold of the band and took charge and uh, kind of drove their musical direction, you know. There's three songs on this album that were just solely written by Tony Banks. And if this was during the Peter Gabriel era, that would be kind of unheard of to have three like three songs just written by one member because they were a very collaborative band. But on Wind and Wuthering, that's how it ended up. So yeah, it's a very Tony Banks heavy album. And um, the rest of the band was fine with that. I mean, Phil Collins was fine as long as he got to like throw his jazz fusion elements here and there. You know, less so than on Trick of the Tail, but you know, he has his jazz fusion elements like peppered throughout. And uh, Mike Rutherford was really close to Tony Banks as well, so he wasn't really putting up a fight. It was really just Steve Hackett that was kind of feeling the tension. And I think a lot of that tension had to do with the fact that he had released a solo album, and he was really feeling confident with his own material. I mean, up till this point, let's face it, Steve Hackett was a fantastic guitar player, especially on Selling England by the Pound. But he was kind of overshadowed in terms of like compositional skills. And writing skills compared to like Tony Banks, uh, Mike Rutherford, and Peter Gabriel. As well as, I guess, Phil Collins. Although Phil Collins always described himself as more of like an arranger of things. Like he would see how certain pieces and bits would kind of fit together. Oh my god, I, I sound like Tony Banks right now saying the word, using the word bits. But, but anyway, uh, that was Phil Collins' role. And Steve Hackett was kind of the same. He would look at a song and just seize elements to add his own guitar tone to it. And this album here is pretty much the same. I mean, like, he only has one major composition on this album. But I really think that, you know, if they allowed Steve Hackett to bring more of his material into this album and replace other songs, it would have been a much stronger album. I mean, look at, look at the song Please Don't Touch, the instrumental. It's such a fantastic instrumental. I mean, like, it's just, it's incredible. And... You know, luckily for us fans, we're, we're still able to hear it because it's on Steve Hackett's second solo album, Please Don't Touch. But imagine if that excellent instrumental was on this album, how much stronger it would be. And also this, the, um, the song Inside and Out, which was later released on their EP, uh, Spot the Pigeon, which was by far the best song on the Spot the Pigeon EP. I mean, that EP was shit. If it wasn't for if it wasn't for Inside and Out, and Steve Hackett had a strong influence on that song as well, and again that song was scrapped for some strange reason. 
So that's two songs that could have easily have been included on this album at the expense of the song What Gorilla, which was a, we'll get into it, but it's like a Phil Collins kind of like jazz fusion, kind of just a shittier version of Los Endos, to be honest, a, a much shittier version. And Your Own Special Way, which was Mike Rutherford's uh, composition on the album, which a lot of fans consider to be a cheesy ballad. Ah, sorry, I had to wet my whistle there. And um, I, I think if they took out those two songs, which comprise about 10 minutes of the album, and replaced it with Steve Hackett's compositions, it would, be, it would have just been a much stronger album. And Steve Hackett really felt the same way, because I hate to say it, but after this album, after the tour... Steve Hackett left Genesis. And what a crappy time to leave Genesis. I mean, Steve Hackett is known for his experimentation, his willingness to think outside the box. And that's really what Genesis were doing at this point. I mean, let's not forget the time we're talking about right now. This is 1976. Think about the popular music at the time. Disco was starting to come out. Okay? Punk was starting to come out. I mean, and here we have Genesis releasing an album like Wind and Wuthering, a 50-minute album, with... Not one, not two, but three instrumentals, okay? Three instrumentals, one of them having jazz fusion elements, and the other ones being like atmospheric keyboard and, well, in the case of one of them, atmospheric keyboard sounds. And you got a song, you got songs with like unconventional subject matter. Scottish Earls, fucking traitors and revolts in One for the Vine. Um, you know, like events on the news in Blood on the Rooftops. A frickin' Adventures of a Mouse on All on a Mouse's Night. Just, <clears throat> sorry, just probably the, the most unhip, unpunk, undisco concepts for songs of all time. And Genesis were really, they didn't give a shit at this point. I mean, they had faith in their fan base that they could handle this more experimental, this more, you know, fantasy based stuff. That they didn't care about like the surrounding musical climate. They just released whatever they wanted. And that's another thing. At this point, as Phil Collins mentioned in interviews, like they really just chose the best songs. So they honestly thought what gorilla was better than in, was better than Inside It Out and Please Don't Touch. So that just goes to show how like adventurous and how you know how Genesis were trying to push the boundaries at that point. And it's a shame that Steve Hackett left, because I think like you know, if Tony Banks gave him more space, allowed him to include maybe one more composition on the album, it would have been, you know, just the whole course of history would have been different. Like Genesis would have just remained one of the greatest progressive rock bands of all time, well into the 80s. And don't get me wrong, I do love these Genesis, but just imagine what could have been if Steve Hackett stayed in the band. And I guess you could say the same about, you know, things like what if John Bonham didn't die? What if Keith Moon didn't die? But, you know, it's lost in the sands of time at this point. We can't really... We can't really predict. We we just we have what we have, and we got to enjoy what we have. That's pretty much what I'm trying to get across. And yeah, so they uh, they went on tour, and then after this tour, Steve Hackett left. It was another successful tour, another successful album. And um, the funny thing about this album is that Tony Banks, in interviews, like obviously he's going to say this about the album because he wrote the majority of the songs, but he he considers this like a harder album to get into than Trick of the Tail. It's funny because he mentions, oh, it takes so many listens, multiple, you know, you have to, like, think about it in depth. And I kind of disagree with him. I mean, sure, it's an experimental album, and it was kind of going against all the conventions at the time. But I, I wouldn't say, it like, it's that hard to get into. I mean, I got into it when I was, like, 16 years old. And, uh, you know, there isn't really, like, too much different from, like, previous Genesis material. Just a lot more Tony Banks. So... A lot more romanticism, you know, it's just, it really isn't that hard to get into. Basically what I'm saying is if you like Genesis up till this point, you will like Wind and Wuthering, no question. So that's pretty much the history behind it. It was just another chapter in 1976 for Genesis. And I kind of think of this and Trick of the Tale as kind of sister albums. They kind of go hand in hand and they kind of represent the same era of Genesis history. So uh, without further ado, let's get into the actual review of this album. You know, what sets it apart, how Genesis progressed forward, maybe how they were going back. We'll talk about all that shit. All right, so now let's get into the actual album review of Wind and Wuthering. Uh, so this is a really interesting album, guys. As I, as I kind of alluded to back in the history, this is 
uh, the history section. This is a very Tony Banks heavy album. And, um, you know, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you ask. And now I mentioned in my Trick of the Tale review that uh, Tony Banks had written a lot of like the lyrical subject matter of the songs and that I wasn't like a huge fan of the lyrical subject matter as it, it you know, it just felt too, you know, honestly, it just felt too straight and to the point, you know, like when Peter Gabriel was in the band and I'm not trying to sound like I'm this like Peter Gabriel fanboy or anything like that. But uh, when Peter Gabriel was in the band, it felt like the lyrics had a lot more depth to them. And then when Tony Banks took over with the lyrics, Tony Banks and Mike Rutherford, it just seemed kind of more like straightforward to the point kind of thing. You know, like the, the comedy was kind of off kilter. It wasn't like, you know, the funniest stuff. It wasn't as quirky, uh, wasn't as creative. And you know what? I got to say the same thing. It remains the same on Wind and Wuthering. Like a lot of the song, a lot of the lyrics are kind of like just surface level, you know, like, like, for example, um, All in a Mouse's Night is about, you know, the adventures of this mouse and this this couple kind of going back and forth between the mouse's point of view and the couple's point of view. And uh, it's just really, it's really cheesy, no pun intended. But honestly, I, I'm not a huge fan of Tony Banks's lyrics. Now, later on in Genesis, things would change. The lyrics would improve a lot with Tony Banks as kind of like the leader of the band. But... At this point, they were kind of like in their initial stages. And so lyrically, I just wanted to get that out of the way. It's not the strongest album. Although um, Blood on the Rooftops is fantastic. And uh, One for the Vine, although the lyrics aren't amazing, the storyline is pretty good. So I will get that out of the way. And uh, so this album's from 1976. Trick of the Tales from 76. What's the difference? Like what's going to separate these two albums? There's actually a big difference. Number one, there's a lot less fairy tale inspired lyrics. Um, well, with the exception of uh, All in the Mouse's Night. It's kind of more grounded in reality, you know. And uh, I got to say, the, this album expands a lot more on the instrumental sections. I mean, ironically, Trick of the Tale is a heavily vocal album, considering that it was their first album after their lead singer left. And now you're getting your... They're getting their fucking drummer from behind the kit singing. You would think it would have a lot more emphasis on the instrumentals. But no, it was a heavily vocal album. This one here is a heavily instrumental album. I mean, there were, as I mentioned, there were three instrumentals on the album. Not to mention during the longer tracks on the album, like One for the Vine. As always with Genesis, you're going to have your long instrumental section in the middle. And um, yeah, there's a lot of instrumentals on this album. A lot of instrumentation. And I guess, uh, you know, I guess that's why, you know, Tony Banks kind of considers it one of like the best Genesis albums because he was really focused on the instrumentation rather than like the lyrics and the vocals. Um, so yeah, this might be hard to get into if you started off with like the 80s era Genesis and you're working your way back. But if you're starting off with like the Peter Gabriel years, you already have a strong foundation on like what Genesis is like instrumentally. And you could like easily extrapolate that to this album. So uh, instrumentally, it's just, you know, really focused on, you know, letting letting the instrumental shine on this album rather than like the lyrical and vocal subject matter. Now, that being said, there are two moments on this album where Phil Collins gives one of his best vocal performances, Afterglow and Blood on the Rooftops, hands down some of the best Phil Collins vocals. Otherwise, it's kind of like on Trick of the Tail where... You know, he doesn't really seem that passionate about it, that into it. You could tell he's kind of just singing to get the job done, except for those two songs. Those are like the major highlights. And it's analogous to Trick of the Tail, kind of like with Ripples and Squonk, where he really shines. And then the rest of the album, he's kind of lackluster. On this album, it's the same thing. He's kind of okay on most of the songs. Definitely good. Let's get that straight. He's not shit. But, uh, you know, doesn't go above and beyond. But on those two tracks... Phil Collins shines as a vocalist, and then later on in Genesis' career, he would continue to do so. so. So, yeah, we have a lot of Tony Banks influence, that's for sure. And the thing about this album is that Tony Banks used a lot more, I'm going to use the word overbearing synthesizer, because there's some sections of the songs where, like, the synthesizer is just in your face and drowns out, like, all the other instruments. And on Trick of the Tail, there was a nice balance 
you know, Tony Banks would go back and forth between synthesizer and classical piano. But on this album, there's a lot more synthesizer. So if you're not a fan of that thing, this might not be the album for you because Tony Banks just goes all out in your face synthesizer at some points. And it kind of just, it's kind of a detrimental aspect of the album because it kind of drowns out a lot of the other instrumentation. So that's one flaw of the album. But uh, it also gives it this like amazing kind of wintry uh, autumn atmosphere to it with like the large expansive synth sounds and like the quiet, you know, not pastoral surprisingly, kind of like, kind of like cold and ominous instrumental sections. So depending on who you ask, that could be a, a curse or a benefit to the album or a blessing. But uh, yeah, for me, eh, it works at some points, like the intro of 11th Earl of Mar, it's fantastic. But then at other points, like on uh, All in a Mouse's Night, it's kind of overbearing, to be honest. So yeah, a little too much Tony Banks synthesizer at some points, but otherwise it's okay. And um, of course, you have your jazz fusion inspired elements. Phil Collins coming in with, you know, tracks like What Gorilla, sections of um, um, In That Quiet Earth, and things like that. And then you got, you have a few romantic songs like thrown in there. Like, um, again, Afterglow is a pretty romantic song. And then you got, um, you got uh, Your Own Special Way, written by Tony, written by uh, Mike Rutherford. So it's a really diverse album. I mean, a lot of people say this album's like, you know, hard to get into, but you know, there's a little bit of everything to kind of enjoy with this album. And um, the one thing I will say about this album is that it has an extremely strong first act and an extremely strong third act. The middle act, the middle three songs, are the weak point of the album. And, you know, that kind of acts to, like, the detriment of the album because it kind of, like, takes you out of it for a good, like, 15-minute chunk of the album. But then you're right back into it. So it starts off with, like, fantastic Genesis music, and then it kind of, like, loses your attention in the middle. And then it, it picks up just as strong, if not stronger, than how it started off. So I will warn you guys that there's a little bit of a dip in quality in the middle of the album. And uh, that should be taken into consideration. And another thing. I mentioned that Steve Hackett only had one writing contribution on the album. Which was Blood on the Rooftops. But overall, his guitar parts are, are evenly scattered throughout the album. And he ends up having a pretty strong influence, believe it or not. You know, when he's able to break through Tony Banks's like overbearing synthesizer sections, he comes across really strong. And uh, it makes sense because he also considers this one of the best Genesis albums. So Steve Hackett fans, don't worry. Although he was kind of shafted and his songs were rejected, he does still have a strong sound on this album. And um, and yeah, that's the thing. I honestly think if they remove What Gorilla, which is Phil Collins' three-minute you know, jazz fusion kind of section, replacing it with the instrumental uh, Please Don't Touch. It would have been a lot stronger. And if they had scrapped the Mike Rutherford ballad, um, oh my God, Your Own Special Way and replace it with Inside and Out, this would have been just as good, if not better, than Trick of the Tail. All right, guys, so uh, without further ado, now that you got a general sense of how this album is structured, let's get into the track-by-track -track reviews. Alright, so kicking it off with track one, we got the 11th Earl of Mar, which is just one of the most bizarre song titles you could possibly imagine. But yeah, basically it's uh, it's one of the longer tracks on the album, clocking in at about seven minutes. And uh, yeah, Genesis was really like going all out, opening the, the album with like a seven minute epic, followed by a 10 minute epic. And they just basically crammed the two epics at the front of the album. And uh it's a great song. You know, a lot of people say it's one of the stronger points of the album. I tend to disagree. I think that uh, Blood on the Rooftops, Afterglow, In That Quiet Earth kind of trump this song. But this song's still very good. It's it's actually excellent. I'm talking about by Genesis standards. But yeah, it's a very, very, um, very progressive song. I mean, it goes through a lot of changes. And uh, it really just shows that Genesis were still in full progressive rock mode. Even more than Trick of the Tail. So maybe that's why... Uh, Tony Banks said this album was kind of hard to get into because they were really 
kind of going for that like hardcore progressive rock sound. Whereas Trick of the Tail kind of like had some commercial elements to it, kind of like Squonk, uh, tr the title track Trick of the Tail. This album here really only has your own special way as the, uh, you know, the commercial moment. But uh, we'll get to that soon. But yeah, 11th Earl of Mar, really interesting track. Um, probably in the, it's in the better half of the songs on the album. It starts off with this incredible synthesizer kind of like theme, which I would describe as probably like the main theme of the album. I mean, it's very expansive, very evocative. I mean, even got like the Mellotron in there building up to like these, these crescendos. And it's just a really cool part of the song, really interesting way to start the album, really sucks you into it. And it's just the musical, the perfect musical representation of a cold, snowy winter day. Just an amazing intro. And you have Steve Hackett's like droning guitar in the background, adding to the atmosphere. Just excellent. But it only lasts a couple seconds, believe it or not. And uh, before you know it, we're into the main theme of the song, which is uh, driven by Tony Banks' organ riff. The... Da, 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 da. And before you know it, we got that overbearing Tony Banks synthesizer sound, which could be a turn off to some people. And uh, Phil Collins comes in. And the thing is, his vocals on this song, uh, not my favorite. I mean, he's kind of like drowned in the instruments. And uh, the verses kind of don't really like lock in with the music as well as I'd like it to. I mean, there's a few cheesy lines like, uh, like they use the word daddy a lot, giving it kind of like a juvenile feel to it. So the lyrics don't kind of fit the song. The vocals kind of don't like mesh in with the music. But uh, luckily enough, the verse only lasts a couple seconds. And uh, then the band locks into this really tight groove, um, which is really cool shit. And you have Steve Hackett playing the guitar. And to this day, I don't even know if it's Steve Hackett or just Tony Banks' synthesizer. But it sounds like the guitar being run through a synthesizer. So it just sounds really interesting. Very un-Steve un Hackett-y if, if it is Steve Hackett. I should have done some more research, but I'm fucking lazy. But yeah, excellent. And then before you know it, the song winds down and um, gets into this like acoustic part. It's just very expansive, very melodic, very kind of like open-ended. And you got some great Tony Banks classical keyboard, which was like a welcome contrast to all that synthesizer at the beginning. And uh, for me, this is the highlight of the album, you know, the part where Phil Collins is, sorry, the highlight of the song, not the highlight of the album. Uh, especially the part where Phil Collins is singing, I'm fighting gravity falling. Dun, dun, dun. That's a really cool part. There's some great Tony Banks, just classic piano sections. Then it gets back into like the original riff and uh, it ends the song off with the, uh, with the original, with the intro, with that atmospheric synthesizer and uh, droning Steve Hackett guitar intro. So yeah, very progressive song, goes through a lot of motions. Uh, it would have been a little, it would have gotten a little bit of a higher score if the verses were more kind of like interwoven with the music, if that makes sense. But I'm still, I still love the song. I love the intro. I love the quiet acoustic section. So I'm going to still give it a 9 out of 10. Cause it's just, it's just a great song. Great way to open the album and a very progressive way to open the album, I must add. 